Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's get started. So today is the is the third uh, lecture of uh, Professor Sashdev. I could only hope that uh, we could keep him longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I'm certainly enjoying my stay here very much. We have Thank wonderful you. talks, and uh, today I think we go to the last piece is uh, strange metals, and uh, let's let's see what uh, um, how much. We will learn out of his lectures. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ziang. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, so today's lecture is uh, relatively independent of the last two lectures. So if you got lost in all the gauge theory and field theory, don't worry. We're going to start from scratch, uh, and I'm going to try to present, uh, you know. Uh, a relatively self-contained discussion where really all you need to know are a little bit about Green's functions, which I'm going to assume you've taken some many body theory course uh, and know about how to use Green's functions. Okay, so I'll begin by just introducing the SYK models just as a uh, toy model on their own right to study the breakdown of the quasi-particle idea. Uh, and then, in, uh, then I'll go on to try to develop a realistic theory of you know, the experimental observations in many materials, not just the cuprates, there are many materials that show strange metal behavior. Uh, and the fact it's so ubiquitous suggests there should be some very simple universal explanation, uh, which I will try to, which we think we have some ideas about. Okay, so uh, I'll just to begin and recall some of the things we learned about the SYK model. Uh, Okay, uh, so this is the picture that I showed in my very first lecture. You imagine you have a bunch of random sites uh, on which there are fermions, uh, and then these fermions can hop uh, from site to site, but only in pairs. So, and for each one of these pair hopping terms, uh, there is a amplitude, uh, and that amplitude is assumed to be an independent random number for each such process. Okay, so that, that's it, that's the definition uh, of the SYK model. Uh, and here's the actual uh, Hamiltonian. So there's just one fermion interaction term, alpha, beta, gamma, delta are the, are the labels for the sites. Uh, and these U alpha, beta, gamma, delta uh, for convenience are taken to have zero mean uh, and uh, variance uh, U squared. There's a conserved quantity, which is the total number of particles, which I call Q, and Q goes between zero and one. Uh, so of course, Q equals zero and Q equals one states are trivial. There's no spin uh, for simplicity. And uh, we're typically interested in what happens when Q is close to a half. Okay, so the simplest way to understand this model and to understand the basic features is just to diagrammatic perturbation theory. So if I do diagrammatic perturbation theory, then there's some bare Green's function. Uh, that's just one over uh, I omega n uh, plus mu with some chemical potential. That's all, there is no kinetic energy at all. Uh, so the first order correction would be something like this. You have a U here. Uh, this would be the first term and then some interaction like that. Okay, so now this U is a random number. So there are of course uh, some indices here. There's an, each line has an index, alpha, alpha here, will be beta, and this will be gamma. This will also has to be gamma as it comes through. Okay, so then we're going to take each such term in perturbation theory and just average it. Uh, average it over the ensemble of values uh, uh, given by this. So when I do the average, uh, if I average this, uh, this is just zero. Okay. All right, so then we have to go to U squared, no surprise. So let's look at the possible U squared terms. There'll be a term like this, uh, something like this, let's see. Uh, and uh, this is the U here, there's a U here, um, and then there'll be, okay. Uh, another line like that. Okay, so that's the part of U squared term. Um, and now again, you've got to put the indices in. 
Um, so now the point is that if this is alpha, well, let's say this is beta, this is gamma, this is delta. Well, the different, if the site indices are different, uh, uh, you know, this is this mean square value is only for a given set of u alpha, beta, gamma, delta. If the site, if the indices here and the indices here are different, since the numbers are independent, it averages to zero. So the indices here must be equal to the indices here. So for example, so this of course has to be gamma, this has to be delta, uh, and then this uh, for everything to work out has to be alpha, alpha, and this becomes alpha. Okay, so now we have to count the powers of n. Um, how many powers of n do I have? Well, there's a one over n to the three half that I snuck in over here. So there's two of them. So I'll go to get a one over n cubed. And then I have to sum over free indices. And how many free indices do I have? Um, I have gamma and delta. So sum over gamma and delta uh, will give me a factor of n squared. Okay. All right, so this is one over n cubed, one over n times n squared. So this diagram is one over n. So it doesn't contribute as n goes to infinity in the large n limit. All right, so this diagram has gone. So what diagram do you have? Well, there's the next, the other diagram is looks like this. Um, and by the same reasoning, this is u, this is u. Uh, okay, so this is alpha, it'll turn out this has to be alpha, this gamma, uh, delta, a rho, and this is the same gamma delta rho. Okay, so now the counting goes as one over n cubed from the uh, uh, from these, and then the three summations that gives you n cubed. So this is one. Aha. Uh -huh. So this contributes in the large n limit. Okay. So now you could now. So that's order u squared. I think that's pretty much it. There's no other graphs at order u squared. You go to order u cubed. Uh, they're all zero because u has zero mean and it's a Gaussian number. So you have to go to order u to the fourth. All right, so I invite you to look at the graphs at order u to the fourth. The reasoning is exactly the same. It's a really simple counting problem. So, you know, I can try to at least sketch some of the graphs at order u to the fourth. So, so what we have, we, let's put up, we've got this one, this, this is, this works. So in order u to the fourth, what are the kinds of graphs that will work? So you will certainly get things like this, which you can imagine should work where, something like this. Uh, basically, you dress internal lines by the same graph. So this has to work. So this will be a order. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so you can sit down and keep drawing graphs to all orders and have a little bit of fun. Uh, just count powers of n. Uh, and when the dust settles, uh, the answer is there's only one graph that survives uh, after you renormalize the internal propagators. So that's it. The self energy 
is just given by this one graph, this graph right here, where these G are fully renormalized Green's function. So this is included, of course, because this is just a, the same self-energy in the internal line. And you can keep going. Of course, these lines also have to be uh, decorated and so on. All right, so, so this is the entire set of equations then that determine uh, the Green's function, which is only a function of frequency. Uh, G of omega is I omega plus mu minus sigma of omega. Sigma is given by this, and this, this is easy to write down in real time. Uh, and of course, this just is a constraint that will determine the value of mu. Okay, so this is it. Uh, uh, these are the equations uh, for two functions, sigma of tau and, and g of tau. Of course, they must obey certain analyticity properties that every Green's function has to obey. Uh, and you can also write them at finite temperature uh, and solve them, okay? <laughs> so uh, I wrote these equations down <laughs> sometime in 92, and I thought, okay, well, we'll figure out what's going on here. Somebody's probably solved these equations before. No, nobody had solved them. Uh, we'll figure something out in a, in a few weeks. We'll know the full answer. Uh, in fact, we're only now understanding the full structure of the solution of these equations. It's quite complicated, but now it's pretty well understood. Uh, and it involves uh, you know, knowing something about quantum gravity, amazingly enough, is hiding in these equations. <laughs> Hard to believe. But okay, I'll try to give you an indication of why that's the case. Uh, but there's some things you can figure out quite simply, uh, which you know I figured out very early on. First of all, you can quickly see from these equations uh, that if there's any solution, the solution must be gapless. There cannot be any kind of exponential decay of the Green's function uh, at large time. It must be a power law decay. And the reason is the following. Suppose, suppose there's, uh, there you go. Suppose there's a gap. Okay, so let the gap be delta. And so if the gap is in, must be in the self-energy and the Green's function should be the same. So G and sigma have the same gap, delta. Now, if I look at this equation, if there's a gap delta in G, then you know, G decays as E to the minus delta tau, then this decays as E to the minus three delta tau. Uh, okay, let's imagine the gap is the same for particles and holes. So this tells us that the gap in sigma is three delta. This tells us the gap in sigma is the same as the gap in G. Uh, that's a contradiction. So the answer is there's no gap. Okay, so there's a generic gapless solution for any value of mu. So it's, that's the argument for self-tuned criticality, if you want to call it. All right, so then it's some power law. So you just imagine it's some power law, uh, plug it in and just again, go through the circulate and you get the answer. So, so so relatively simple uh, computation, you can work out the long time behavior of this, this system at zero temperature. Uh, and basically through a simple analysis of those equation, you conclude that G of tau decays is one over square root of tau. Okay, if you want me to go through the argument. Okay, so it, it's really quite simple. Uh, we can just check how it works. Um, you can do it for general power alpha and you'll find it won't, you know, this alpha equals one half is the only solution. So G of tau, okay, let's do it. Uh, so let, you know, tau to the alpha. Then sigma will go as one over tau to the three alpha. Then sigma of omega uh, will then, you take a Fourier transform, uh, will be a constant, constant plus omega to the power um, of, it'll turn out three alpha, minus one. Okay, then G of omega, so G of omega is one over I omega plus mu. Uh, uh, minus sigma of zero, uh, minus this thing, omega to the three alpha minus one. Now, but G of omega, we also know from here, G of omega goes as uh, omega uh, to the uh, one minus alpha by Fourier transform. 
Okay, so this one minus alpha must somehow relate to that. How is that going to happen? Well, it can only happen, uh, well, first of all, this is probably not important, but this tells us that mu must equal sigma of zero, otherwise there's no solution. So if mu is equal to sigma of zero, uh, then this will give me, this goes as omega to the one minus three alpha. Uh, and this is probably alpha minus one. <laughs> So now alpha minus one must equal one minus three alpha, and that tells me alpha is one half. So that's really the only solution. Okay. All right, so you get, uh, now I haven't distinguished here between positive time and negative time. Uh, you should distinguish, so now if mu is zero and Q is one half, then it's the same, it's particle all symmetric but generally it's not. Uh, and so in general, there's a particle hole asymmetry. Uh, so this, we parameterize it by in this way. So E is just a number which goes between minus infinity to infinity. And this is somehow determining at very long times or very low energies, the particle hole asymmetry. Now what determines the particle hole asymmetry uh, microscopically is the value of Q. It's Q minus a half. If Q is one half, then E would be zero, okay? Because particles and whole would be the same. Uh, so there should be some relation between the, the UV parameter Q uh, and the infrared parameter E. Now we are very familiar with such relations in Fermi liquid theory. In Fermi liquid theory, the Fermi wave vector is the infrared parameter. It gives you the long wave of decay. And the charge Q is the UV parameter. And there's a Luttinger theorem that connects the Fermi wave vector to the charge Q. Well, there turns out to be a Luttinger theorem here also, which is much more complicated to derive. Uh, I refer you to these papers. And there's a connection, exact relationship between the number E and the number Q. And it's given by this complicated equation. All right, so I'm not going to derive that. Uh, okay, so those are some of the infrared properties. Now, in fact, you can determine the coefficient here also exactly by doing these Fourier transforms a bit more carefully. Uh, and so now we know the long time decay. Okay. All right, so this was pretty much worked out pretty quickly uh, in the early days. It's not that hard. The amazing thing is that you can now also turn on a finite temperature and get a completely exact solution in the long time limit. So in the limit, so now we are imagining that uh, there's one energy scale in the problem and that's U. So in the limit that temperature and frequency is much, much smaller than U, uh, but omega over t is arbitrary, uh, we can find a solution. So g of omega is given by, well, I'll show you the expression in a minute. This is in time. Uh, and how did this, how was this uh, actually worked out? Well, it was first obtained by Georges and Parcolet in 99. Uh, and they obtained it essentially by guesswork. They just said, well, let's imagine it's this one over square root of sine. Where did this come up with? Well, this is the very familiar form that appears in conformal field theories. So let's try it. <laughs> uh, so they tried it and went through exactly what I went through on the board, but a little more carefully at finite temperature. That's all, it's not a complicated thing. Uh, you do it and it works, <laughs> amazingly. Uh, but I'll try to explain that better in a few minutes. Uh, and if you take the Fourier transform of this, this is the result you get. So now G of omega or the retarded Green's function is this ratio of gamma functions. Everything is completely known in terms of U or temperature. Uh, and it's a scaling function of omega over temperature. And this is what it looks like. So uh, Q equals one half, which is particle hole, particle hole symmetric. And then this is also even in omega. Uh, and you know, decays as one over square root of omega and has this scaling function as a function of omega over t. Now, if this is a Fermi liquid or disordered Fermi liquid, 
it would be just a temperature independent constant. But here, this is a very strong function of omega over T. Uh, and the line width, if you wish, is just the Planckian time, which is KT over H bar. So that's you know, one of the nice features then, this strongly interacting system uh, has some relaxational time. You can also look at non-equilibrium Green's functions, which we have done in recent years. And again, you find that the relaxational time, the equilibration time uh, to thermal equilibrium is independent of the strength of interactions. So that's something you will never find in the Boltzmann equation. You had a Boltzmann equation for interacting fermions. Uh, the equilibration time depends on the strength of the interaction, depends on the collision term, which has a coefficient, which depends on the collision cross-section. This completely drops out here. Uh, it gives you a uh, equilibration time, which is just h bar over kt, independent of the strength of u. Okay, so that's uh, very exciting because that's the kind of behavior you want uh, in a strange metal, at least roughly speaking. Okay. All right, so, so that's a summary of some of the basic properties of the SYK model. Uh, a lot more is known, including uh, now one over n corrections and e to the minus n corrections. It's all thoroughly understood today. Well, not everything, but, and that has led to all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, advances in understanding of black hole evaporation and, and uh, wormholes and all of that. Okay, so I don't want to go into that because that's really more of, of interest to people than quantum gravity and string theory. Um, what I want to do is just spend a little time uh, showing you why is there even a connection uh, to gravity. Uh, and that will also show you where this, you know, why this magical conformal solution actually worked. You took a random system and at low enough temperatures, no matter the coupling, it's conformal, <laughs> kind of amazing. Uh, uh, so let's try to understand that. So to, to understand that, uh, is you have, I'm going to use a path integral method, okay? So we derived the equations in the large end limit just by drawing diagrams. But if you want to go beyond large end limit, it's much simpler to use a path integral method. So what, so the way you do path integrals, um, is first of all, uh, you introduce a replica index, and then you just average the Feynman path integral. So the Feynman path integral, uh, you know, is for a given sample, it's d of c alpha uh, of an action. Uh, uh, there's a d tau, c dagger alpha d c alpha d tau. And then there's a mu and there's the interaction u alpha beta gamma delta c dagger alpha c dagger beta c gamma c delta. Okay, so then you introduce replicas, so n replicas and then you average. Uh, so that means you have to put in a replica index here, a, 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 a. Uh, and then you average the whole thing. Now, this is a simple average because it's an average now over uh, a Gaussian variable, uh, and you can just average it, and you'll get the square of this term. So that's how you get uh, this term here. And, and the magic here, and I apologize, I should be alpha here. I should change that. <laughs> uh, you can take, so you get HCs, and then the indices work out very beautifully that you can just write it uh, as the fourth power of sum over i or sum over alpha. Uh, and the other important thing to note is that there are two times, d tau, d tau prime, uh, because when you do the average, you're going to couple together two replicas and different times, each replica has a different time tau. Okay, so that's a very typical thing uh, when you're doing impurities uh, in, in a quantum system. Uh, each replica has an independent time. Okay, so now, the, now, the, now we're going to, uh, the, the nice thing is that this, the site index is also inside here. And we can, just by doing some Hubbard-Chotanovich-like tricks, 
we can do the path integral formally over all the fermions. So this path integral is not very useful because it's a path integral over n fields and n is going to infinity. We'd like to simplify that. Okay, so the way you simplify it is you just insert this identity uh, where I'm just defining g of tau one tau two to be a delta function at this object here. Uh, and that's of course the in equilibrium, that's the Green's function, but this is now some fluctuating field. Uh, and when I do the integral over sigma, this you know over the imaginary axis, this gives you a delta function. All right, so this is just one then, because when you have a delta function, do the integral over g, you get one. So you plug in one, and now life is good because g is is a delta function of this variable, so I can replace this c dagger c by g. Uh, and then when you do that, the action is quadratic in the C and you can integrate it out to C. All right, so when the dust settles, this is what you get. So now you have an integral over two fields, not over N fields. This is an exact representation of the average partition function. I've dropped the replica index because it's not important at the level we are going to work. Uh, Okay, so this is the partition function. The action is right here. Is that that's the complete action uh, of uh, this comes from the fermion integral. There are two fields, sigma and g, and on the saddle point, both these fields are precisely the self-energy and the Green's function. Uh, and the other important point to note: these functions are functions of two different times, not one time. These are bilocal fields, and that's. Uh, turns out to be really important um, and uh, uh, has responsible for many of the properties we're going to see. And it comes from the average over these random couplings, which had two different times, like I just mentioned. All right, so this is the path integral period. <laughs> so this is uh, string theory is called this the G sigma theory. Okay. So it turns out. Now you can take this G sigma theory and go to very low energies. It can be shown to be exactly equivalent in low energies to theory of quantum gravity. But we just obtained it without knowing anything about gravity, uh, but as a, uh, a theory of uh, the SYK model. All right, so let's notice a few things about this. First of all, in the large n limit, I can just take the saddle point. So I put ds dg equals zero, ds d sigma equals zero, what do I get? Uh, I get the same old equations. <laughs> the saddle point of this action is the equations are derived by just doing simple Feynman diagrams, which we have solved at least in the low temperature limit. Uh, okay. The other important point is that these equations have some remarkable symmetry. So what happens is uh, in these equations at very low energies, we already saw that when I solved these equations on the board, uh, you know, G of omega, let's see. Uh, yeah, okay, so G of omega uh, was, you know, I omega plus mu minus sigma of zero minus square root of omega. So what happened at low frequency, is this combined to give you zero, this is equal to zero. And this is less important than square root, so you can forget about it. So basically only the square root of omega to survive. So in this theory, that means that I can just drop uh, this, d by, I, this d by d tau gives me the i omega, I can drop the mu because it cancels against a constant. I can just throw that term out. So if I throw this term out, then the remaining action has a huge symmetry. And it has a symmetry under uh, both, it has an emergent gauge symmetry and it has an emergent time reparameterization symmetry. So this is again, relatively easy to check that if I take this bilocal function, G of tau and sigma of tau and make tau a function of sigma, so I'm going from one time coordinate tau to a new time coordinate sigma. And in the new frame, uh, new time frame sigma, 
I have a new Green's functions, G and sigma, which are related to the old Green's function by this derivatives of this time reparameterization. And these powers are very much closely related to uh, these powers that we found here. Uh, forget about little g, that's the gauge transformation, that's not important for now. All right, so that's a huge symmetry of this theory when you ignore these UV, uh, these terms that are irrelevant in the low energy limit. Why is this coming back? Okay. All right, so that's, I mean, that's all I'm going to say uh, because this time reparameterization symmetry doesn't appear in more realistic models. Uh, but it, it explains why there's a connection to gravity because gravity also is coordinate invariant, uh, you know, has a co uh, general coordinate invariance, which means you can take any coordinates, uh, any, uh, uh, any set of coordinates and the form of the action is the same in any coordinate system you like. There's general coordinate invariance is the foundation of general relativity. Here, this is general coordinate invariance in one time dimension. Now, of course, gravity in one time dimension, uh, it doesn't really exist. You need at least one space dimension. Um, and that also appears when you, uh, you know, implement uh, holography a little bit. So in this case, th things are simple. If you start with gravity in one space in one time dimensions, uh, you can choose your coordinate that all the dynamical degrees of freedom are actually on the boundary. Uh, and, and that theory on the boundary is the theory we've written here. So you can do like a, the, the inverse of what you do in Chen Simon's gauge theory, you know. Chen Simon's gauge theory, you know that if you have the bulk theory, you can get the boundary theory. But in principle, you can do the opposite. You can start from the boundary theory and get the bulk theory. If you do that procedure here, you will get a certain 2D gravity theory. Okay, uh, so that's all I have to say about connection to gravity. Uh, now I can also understand where this finite temperature solution appeared because now we can map zero temperature to finite temperature by the standard map. And if you do that, then you find that knowing this, uh, that's all you need to know, uh, you can determine this. Uh, and then from that, you get all of this, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so that's a lightning summary of the SYK model and its crucial, simple and important properties. Any questions? <laughs> okay, so uh, now the rest of my discussion is to now go to finite you know, get something realistic <laughs> that I can apply to some of my favorite material. Uh, this is entirely unrealistic. Well, at least uh, you could imagine making uh, a quantum simulation where you design your material to look like this model with random hopping everywhere. And in fact, there are a lot of interesting ideas on that. Uh, and I suspect there are going to be some results on that soon. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, we want to somehow take this theory right now and try to make it more realistic for, you know, ordinary quantum matter in the lab uh, by at the very least giving it a spatial coordinate. There's no space in this theory. It's just a, it's the theory of a quantum dot. I want to make a theory of an extended system. Okay, so it turns out that the theory that generalized, so many people have started with the SYK model and tried to put SYK atoms on a lattice and couple them together in a chain and solve it. There's, there's a, quite a big literature on that. Uh, and it's taught us a lot, but in the end, it doesn't give what's seen in the experiments, uh, which is a strange metal, which I'll show you. Uh, I'll define what I mean by a strange metal shortly. What it gives uh, instead is a, uh, a bad metal. A bad metal is something that resistance is a linear function of temperature. You do get that, but the resistance is really large. It's not a, a strange metal is not a bad metal as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but somewhat different root has turned out to be much more productive. Uh, and that's not starting from the XYK model, but starting from 
uh, what people call now called the Yukawa SYK model. And this is something I think you've studied here. Some of you have studied this also. So the Yukawa, here's uh, one realization of the Yukawa SYK model. It's, you know, it's very similar, except it involves both fermions and bosons. Uh, so you have a fermion psi and a boson phi. Now, the fermions uh, have ju just have, they have no kinetic energy. They just have a chemical potential. And the bosons have, are oscillators at the same frequency omega naught. So again, no dispersion. Uh, and then there's some interaction, G, I, J, L. And we take this to be uh, independent random numbers again. So we can turn exactly the same crank and go through uh, all of the same analysis. Uh, these are the saddle point equations. Uh, and then you can solve them by the same methods. And the solutions are really very similar. Oops, here are the solutions. Uh, you get some strange power, uh, not 0 0.5, but 0 0.42037 for the model I've given you. Uh, and, uh, and you can go to finite temperature, you have the emergent conformal invariance, and you also have the time reparameterization symmetry in the low energy limit. Uh, oops. So, there was the G sigma path integral I gave you the SYK model. Here, the G sigma for uh, this Yukawa SYK model. So this now has uh, the Green's function of the fermion G, the self energy of the fermion, the Green's function of the phonon or the phi D, and the self energy. Uh, this is the the action, and then the saddle point equations are these equations. Uh, so you know, it's just twice as many equations, but the solution is not twice as difficult. It's really pretty much the same tricks. <laughs> okay. All right. So now I'm done with the SYK type models. Uh, and now I want to get to the real world. <laughs> so this is the real world. <laughs> this is, for example, this is a cuprate phase diagram. Uh, and the idea here uh, is, to, is to try to think of what is a possible theory for the strange metal? All right, so for the cube rates, you know, so it'll turn out what you need in the end uh, is some Fermi surface, some fermions, and you need some, some low energy boson. And this boson could be many, almost anything. It could be some, your favorite auto parameter, uh, antiferromagnetism, charge density wave, uh, ferromagnetism, <laughs> they all work actually amazingly. Uh, or it could be uh, what I introduced earlier, a charge on field or something like that. It could be a Higgs boson. Uh, they all work amazingly. I'll show you why. Uh, so for the case of the cuprates, uh, what I believe is that the important thing is the transition from uh, the pseudo gap to the Fermi liquid. Uh, so you're going from the pseudo gap to the Fermi liquid, uh, and there's a strange metal in between. And this particular phase diagram that I showed you yesterday uh, also gives us a very a candidate boson, uh, which actually related to the ancilla theory. But uh, anyway, all I just want to say is that there is a boson that comes out of the theory I described yesterday. Uh, that will be uh, that will do the trick. All right. Uh, but first, let me summarize what are the, some of the properties of this remarkable state of matter called the strange metal. So the most famous one, uh, like here in the data and the cube rates, is that the resistance is a linear function of temperature. Um, but it's also been seen, for example, in twisted bilayer graphene above the superconducting dome. Here, you get, again, a resistance of linear function of temperature. All right. Uh, but the other important thing is that this linear resistivity goes to very, very low temperature. This is just the superconductivity. If you suppress the superconductivity in a field, it, it continues down essentially to zero temperature. Uh, so that's my definition of a strange metal is some model where the resistivity is a constant plus term linear in T uh, as T goes to zero. And furthermore, the resistivity is small. 
it's not, you know, in fact, here it's almost going to zero. Uh, it, and it's particular, it should be smaller than H over E squared. Now, there are many models, including these lattice SYK models that give you bad metals, but these have resistivity, which is linear in T, but much larger than H over E squared. Okay. So that's one property. Another property is in the optical conductivity. So when you do some optical experiments, you measure sigma of omega, uh, and up to logarithms, uh, these people have argued in a recent paper that a lot of data can be fit to this form where this transport scattering rate is basically a linear function of frequency or temperature with some scaling function phi. And then M star over M is determined by Kramer's Kronig and has a log. And, and so it is a complicated function, uh, but it's only the, uh, the, the real part of one over sigma uh, that has the scaling behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question is, does linear anti-resistivity always signature of strained metal? Uh, yeah, the answer is, that's my definition of a strange metal, yes. <laughs> uh, there's certainly no shortage of data uh, of that behavior. That's, so that's what I'm trying to describe. Okay. Uh, so in fact, optical conductivity has been measured uh, in a lot of systems. Uh, here are some very famous data in the cuprates from in nature, so it must be correct, uh, <laughs> by Dirk Munda Merrill's group, where they saw at high frequency some omega to the minus two third behavior. Uh, but at low temperatures, this I mean, low frequencies, you didn't get this omega over T scaling. So it wasn't clear what, what really was going on. Uh, and now uh, Dirk Munda Merrill himself has decided that's not right, that if you, the proper way to analyze the data is what I just told you. Uh, it's in fact one over omega with certain logs, uh, and that actually provides an excellent fit of all the data as a function of frequency and temperature um, as uh, uh, shown in this paper, very, you know, relatively recent paper. Uh, the observations were right, so I'm not, I'm not, and uh, it's just, a, there's a much more improved theoretical understanding of these beautiful observations. Okay, um, so that's what I showed you earlier. So these are the basic transport properties. Uh, resistivity, linear, and temperature, optical conductivity going as one over omega with some log corrections. And these logs help explain why there's people who are seeing other strange powers. When you put the logs in, it, it fits actually much better. Uh, now let's look at photoemission properties. Uh, so in the cube rates uh, near the nodal point, if you look at the imaginary part of electron self energy, so in SYK, that would go as square root of omega. Uh, but here it actually goes as linear function of omega. So one over the inelastic scattering rate is also a linear function of omega. So now that's you know, very suggestively similar to what's happening here in the optical conductivity. Uh, and there's a famous paper by Varma et al, which asserted that both of these are equivalent and, uh, and this is what they called a marginal Fermi liquid. Now, an important point in our analysis, these are not equivalent. It's really crucial to distinguish these two. That's in fact, the entire theory is built on understanding that difference. Uh, so my definition of a marginal Fermi liquid is somewhat narrower than Varma's definition. My definition is anything that obeys has this property in the self energy uh, with imaginary part of self energy going as omega, uh, that is a marginal Fermi liquid, okay. And this, the cube rates are also a marginal Fermi liquid in this definition. Uh, and really the task for theory is to come up, is to show the connection between these two, which no one has shown before, despite lots of claims. <laughs> uh, 
And then this paper that emphasized also, if you look at a strange metal at low temperature, it has a T log T specific heat. All right, so this is just a summary of data. Uh, in fact, a lot of this is summarized in this very nice RMP, um, just recently come out. Uh, and so this is, the, this is my definition of the strange metal problem is to understand all of this. Okay, I'll provide a theory for this. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you a simple model which reproduces all of these behavior. Uh, I don't know if it's the final answer, I, I doubt it. Uh, but, and we have to do more quantitative checks, but we're very encouraged. So let's see, you can decide for yourself. <laughs> All right, so let me now describe the model and how we solve it. In fact, the way we're going to solve it is very much, if you understood the solution of the SYK model, it's really, that's just the same thing with a few more bells and whistles. Okay, and this is work with uh, my former student, Avishkar Patel, who's now at the Flatiron Institute, uh, current student, how you go. Uh, why does this keep coming back? Uh, and a postdoc, Ilya Estelitz, who's moving to Wisconsin. Oh, I should have removed that. This is from the March meeting. <laughs> okay. All right. So, like I said, the key thing turns out to be uh, to have a Fermi surface and some boson. But these has to be, you know, and I'll take the very simple example of a boson, not the <laughs> not this uh, Higgs boson or anything, just something very simple. Uh, all right, so imagine you have some phase transition, for example, in a, and this happens in the nictides, where, which also displays strange metal behavior, uh, where you have some uh, Fermi surface, which has on a square lattice, so it has a square-like shape. Uh, then as you turn up some coupling lambda, uh, it distorts into a rectangular shape. So there's an Ising auto parameter, you know, exactly similar to what we heard this morning, <laughs> uh, which I'll call phi. Okay. Uh, and this is the phase transition between this theory, this phase and this phase. Okay. So if I now turn on a finite temperature, then at finite temperature, there is this phase transition where you go from the symmetry broken phase to the system symmetry restored phase. And as this temperature goes to zero near the quantum critical point, you have some quantum critical region. Here. Now, if I cross the finite temperature boundary, then the theory that uh, we were hearing about this morning will apply. So in this case, you're in two dimensions, so you'll get just the 2 deising model will tell us about the critical properties across this boundary. So your first guess would be, if I'm looking at the zero temperature critical point, I just take the 3 deising model, which also we heard about this morning, uh, and that would be the end of the story. Well, that is not correct, as was first pointed out by Hertz. Uh, and the reason it's not correct uh, is because there's a Fermi surface floating around, and the Fermi surface gives you dissipative uh, damping to the phi excitation. So the effective action for phi is not uh, relativistic five fold field theory. It's got some long range interactions and long range propagator in time. Okay, so so there is, so I will tell you about the structure of this critical point. Uh, it turns out to be a, another example of a system which is now pretty well understood, which has no quasi particles. And this is also something you have studied in your quantum Monte Carlo. Okay, so, uh, and the theory and, you know, is not doing too badly. The question really is now, if I go here in this quantum critical region and measure it, do I get a strange metal? Do I get transport properties in particular that look like a strange metal? Uh, and the answer is definitely not. <laughs> and so I'll show you why not, and that that will also suggest a cure. Okay, so first uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at this theory. Uh, let me first derive. So the theory is that as you turn up some interaction, which I'm now calling J, I should have again updated those slides to make them J. 
uh, this lambda here is like j goes this way. Okay. Okay. Um, lambda is minus j or something. Okay. So there, there's some form factors here which puts in all the cosine terms to you know to change from square to rectangle. I've just dropped it. So there's some local interaction. Uh, and then you do a Hubble Stranovich to decouple it with a phi squared. Uh, and uh, so this is the theory now. This is like very much like the Yukawa SY model I talked about. There's a scalar field phi squared, which has, uh, in fact, I haven't even put any uh, kinetic energy here. It turns out not to be important. The most important difference is that the fermions have a momentum label and they have a Fermi surface. Uh, and this is the Yukawa coupling. Okay, so now this has been studied a great deal. Uh, and let me just summarize some of the properties. So first, you basically, you know, do perturbation theory to begin with. Uh, when you take the fermion bubble inside a boson propagator, you get this mod omega over Q Landau damping by evaluating if, you know, this is the Lindhardt bubble that I presume you've all seen in uh, yeah, many body theory course. So if you take the imaginary part, you get the Landau damping. Uh, and, and this is what makes, you know, this is the point of Hertz made that because of this Landau damping, uh, it's not a relativistic theory. So the boson Green's function at the critical point is not one over Q squared plus omega squared, it's one over Q squared plus omega over Q. <laughs> Highly non-relativistic. Now you take this boson propagator and put it in the electron self energy and you evaluate this graph and you get this omega to the two third. That's the famous result of Patrick Lee. Uh, and uh, so then you get a fermion Green's function, uh, which is sort of like the SYK Green's function in the sense of the self energy is a power of omega. Here it's two third and SYK is one half. Uh, and, but there's also this dispersion which we didn't have in SYK. And this dispersion gives you a Fermi surface. All right, so so that's all of this is correct, and uh, has been a lot of this has been checked by Corner Monte Carlo that uh, Ziang and others have done. Uh, you can actually also just you know, for fun get all of these results starting from a G sigma theory. You do the exact same kind of thing as you did for the SYK model. Uh, formally, that amounts to adding some other replica indices and uh, other flavor indices and taking the larger limit. But anyway, uh, or you can just view this as a definition of the model. Uh, you get some G sigma theory, very much like the Yukawa SYK model. The only difference is now things are bilocal in space and in time, uh, and there's some dispersion inside the trace logs. And the saddle point are exactly these equations, which actually have been known for 50 years. These are sometimes called the migdal Ilyashvig equations. Uh, so you solve these equations, just like I solved the SYK equations. And it turns out solving the fully self-consistent equations doesn't change the answer. The answer is what I just showed you, omega to the two-third. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's... The perturbative answer is, in fact, the full answer for the fully self-consistent solution of the migdal ilyashvig equations. All of these things have been known for quite a while. <laughs> and now they've also been tested numerically, and it's all fine. Okay, the somewhat more recent advances are a better understanding of the transport properties of this theory. So now what we have, you know, if you look at this Green's function, we have something we could call a non-Fermi liquid. It's called a Fermi surface. The Fermi surface is very well defined. The Fermi surface is just where E of K goes to zero. So there's a very well defined sharp Fermi surface in momentum space. But in energy space, there's no delta function for the Green's function on the Fermi surface. You know, in Fermi liquid theory, there's a delta function on the Fermi surface for the Green's function. Here there isn't. It's broad in frequency space because there are no quasi particles. Uh, anyway, okay. So now the question becomes, what happens when you uh, apply an electric field and you try to drive some current? Uh, in the original paper of Patrick Lee, he said there's a resistivity that goes as T to the four thirds. Uh, okay, 
that's wrong. <laughs> uh, in fact, yeah, okay. So now, uh, first of all, you know, just a further thought shows you, and this is something I, you know, we pointed out a while back, uh, the resistance is actually zero <laughs> in this theory. If you take this low energy theory, which gives you the omega to the two thirds self energy, it is a non-Fermi liquid, but this non-Fermi liquid uh, has zero resistance. It's a perfect metal as far as transport is concerned. And the reason is really quite simple when you think about it a little bit more. All, all of these results are derived in some continuum theory uh, of everything is you know just single patches patches on the Fermi surface coupling to some long wavelength excitation. And that theory has a continuous transcendental symmetry. So it in fact has a conserved momentum. And so if you set up a current, any current carrying state has a finite momentum. Now the current can decay because current is not conserved, but momentum is conserved. <laughs> so the momentum cannot decay. So the current will decay a little bit uh, so that uh, until it reaches the equilibrium value that the initial momentum state prefers. Each momentum state prefers a certain current because that's the state of maximum entropy given the current. So the current will flow forever, basically, and so the resistivity is zero. So there's a delta function at zero frequency in the real part of the conductivity. Uh, and there's some memory function methods where you can, you know, just derive this quite systematically. Okay, so it's perfect metal. Uh, and, you know, this is something has been known, but forgotten many times. Uh, it's also a version of what's called Cohn's theorem. Cohn showed that electron interactions don't change the cyclotron frequency, but they also, at zero magnetic field, don't change the fact that uh, current doesn't decay. And it, uh, it's also a version of what's called phonon drag. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about electron phonon scattering, there's a famous formula called the block Gruneisen formula that gives you T to the fifth scaling of the resistivity at low temperatures. Everyone uses it all the time and it works. Uh, just, <laughs> but the block Gruneisen theory as written is wrong. It's just wrong at low temperatures because at very low temperatures, you have only acoustic phonons and acoustic phonons cannot dissipate the momentum of the electrons. <laughs> this has also been known and forgotten many, many times <laughs> in the field. Uh, so why does the block Grunazin work at all? Because, well, there are always some impurities. Momentum is not really conserved. No, more, no metal is really perfect. There are impurities. And the electron phonon scattering is so weak that once an electron scatters over phonon, that phonon is never going to come back. It's going to hit the boundary of the crystal or hit an impurity and it's gone. So its momentum is lost. However, here, this is not a weakly coupled theory. Phi is extremely strongly coupled to psi. In fact, it's so strongly coupled that psi doesn't even exist. Even phi doesn't exist. Only the composite exists. So you can only talk about total momentum. You cannot separate the momentum of psi with the momentum of phi. Yeah. Okay, so you need umklap, but umklap is not operated at low temperature. Anyway, so, so that's the answer. Resistivity is zero. It's not t to the full third or anything else. But even further, if we look at the optical conductivity, uh, this famous paper uh, said that the optical conductivity is omega to the minus two third. And they wrote down these diagrams to compute the optical conductivity. And they computed these diagrams, but they actually failed to evaluate the coefficients. Each of these diagrams does give you a term like this. But if you sit down and actually compute this series, uh, which how you did, you find C is zero. <laughs> There's nothing, it's a perfect metal. And this is actually just similar to Cohn's theorem, uh, conductivity. In fact, even in a finite magnetic field, this works. And this is some new result of how we, that we are writing up. All right, so, and this may be a time for break. This is the, this problem that has been studied for 20, you know, since the time of Hertz. This is one example of it, there are many others. Uh, they all have this property that in two dimensions, a perfect Fermi surface coupled to some critical bosonic mode can give you a nice non-Fermi liquid. Quasi-particles disappear, 
electron spectral fraction is broad, you have strange power laws, you have omega over t scaling, all of that comes. But if you look at the transport, it's actually, there's nothing. It's just a perfect level. <laughs> all right, so time for a break. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I think in the audience we have some short questions. Yeah. 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 So if you put a lattice, you will have umclap, but umclap requires, um, you know, large momentum transfer and high energy excitations. So umclap will only give you Fermi liquid like correction, like T squared. It will not give you linear and T. No, yeah. I don't know of any mechanism where umclap gives you a linear entity. So what I believe is to get strange metal behavior, you have to put in disorder. A perfect, if you had a perfectly clean crystal, it will not show linear entity resistivity. That's the prediction of our theory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yesterday, you did you find the theory. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of physics in the cuprates, which is very special to the cuprates, like the pseudo gap, all these gauge theories, these Higgs fields, I think spin liquid, that's, that is really special to the cuprates. Uh, and uh, along with high temperature superconductivity. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the strange metal is not special to the cuprates, it's everywhere. Strange metal is a much more common phenomenon. Do you mean the linear? Absolutely. I just showed you twisted by graphene. It happens in uh, nictides. It happens. Yeah, yeah, I showed you the data. Uh, <laughs> many materials show strange metal behavior, not just the cuprates. So it really calls for some very simple general theory of and SYK model is also like it's a very it's a theory, it's a theory with almost no physics, it's just random coupling. That's all. Uh, but it's amazing that that's enough to give you some, uh, some, you know, absence of quasi particles. So that's the lesson we have learned: is that, uh, at least I learned, <laughs> that uh, once you put in some sort of random couplings, uh, you can. That's probably the direction to go to get some generic strange metal behavior. So the requirements in the end. This is the punchline of my talk. Is the requirement for getting a straight metal behavior uh, is some Fermi surface, uh, some random interactions it'll turn out. That's, I haven't explained that why. And uh, a, a boson that's critical. And different systems can have different bosons. So in the cube rates, the gauge theory will be important to give me the right, give me a boson. That's all I need. Everything I talked about yesterday is to give me some boson, which is getting critical in the strange metal regime. <laughs> so actually, I have a, a re related question. So for, according to your definition, now if I have a Fermi surface, I have a critical boson. I can have a non-Fermi liquid. Yes, but I cannot have a strange metal. That's in in the if you have a system with no spatial disorder, no spatial disorder. Okay, uh -huh. it's, so it's, it's that's all. That's all. That's what I've shown before. Right, what I've shown right, now right. is like a no go. That I see. I see. I see. But this I, model that we've been studying for as a non Fermi yeah. liquid is a beautiful non Fermi liquid. Right, but it's not a strange metal. It's not a strange metal because the transport is doesn't doesn't doesn't. Yeah, the and, transport the resistivity is zero, but the resistivity is zero. It's not a bad thing, right? It's a, it's, it's a good, it's a good thing, right? It's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, by zero, I mean, yeah. there's always T squared corrections. You uh -huh. know, uh, there see. will be umpla, there's various T squared terms. Yeah, yeah. Zero, that means there's no singular terms. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> and of course, there'll be impurities as a drew to contribution from impurities. We're going to put all that in. Okay. Uh, but still, it requires one more new idea. 
okay. to uh, to get strain metal behavior, right. which right. is in our recent paper. This Good. well, <laughs> yes, yes. I think there's a one online question. Yeah, and uh, I think let's let's just yeah. This is really interesting. I mean, this is, yeah. Uh, Oh, the question is, uh, this was a follow-up of, of the definition, yeah. But in latent liquid, it, uh, it seems there is also linear anti-resistivity. Uh, I don't think so. I don't know where are you getting that from. Uh, latent liquid has the same, its resistivity is zero. I mean, you have to put in impurities or something else to get any resistivity at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's fine. So yeah, let's let let's let's take a short, like five minutes kind of break and let, let's let's continue. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So what for the statement is eventually without disorder, but some other mechanism mechanism will eventually bring this non familiar with the fact of that.
that the first one is uh, more likely to be <laughs> as regards, but and finally, it's, 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 it's okay. I think we just started, okay. yeah. Okay. I don't understand why this floating meeting control keeps coming it back. Was, it was, yeah, so. Some question. Question. Oh, I see. That's why it comes uh, back. Maybe, yeah, I see. Yeah, I already answered that. Uh, question. Still the, the default, uh, so we can answer later. Yeah. Oh, there's some reference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh yeah so the my answer to this question would be many papers by famous people are not correct <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they i don't know what problem they're looking at <laughs> okay all right, so we want to put in some disorder. Okay, so this is the model we had. Uh, Fermi surface, some boson with the Yukawa coupling. So we put in a random potential for the fermions. Now, this is the basis of the Druda theory of metals. You put in a random potential, you get the Druda conductivity, and E squared tau over M. So what happens when, so that will generally happen here too. Uh, but uh, uh, what happens when phi goes critical? So, so suppose phi is tuned to some critical point, then what happens to the Druda theory? Okay, so this is what we studied. Nobody actually really studied this carefully. And the answer is, it's still a Druda theory. So let me show you how that works. So, you know, here we just take our favorite G sigma theory. Uh, and then we add an extra term when you average over V, you get a G, G. And with the delta function here, that's because you don't have translational symmetry anymore because of the random potential. And then you get a saddle point equation. These are the migdal lelash big equations. All you have to do is add another term here. Uh, that's the usual Druda term. The self-energy is V squared times bubble. So, you know, that's just this very simple term that you... Uh, you know, that you do in disorder perturbation theory. Here's G, uh, here's a V, and then there's a V over there. You average over V, so you get average of V squared, uh, and this is a G there, and that's it. That's what you learn in graph for when you're doing Druda theory in Green's function. So you just add that term in here to the other terms that you have in the SYK, like Migdada Rajput set of equations. Now you just turn the crank and you solve these equations, okay? Just the same crank I turned for the SYK model. Okay, what do you find? Well, you know, these are the, uh, basically these are the diagrams here that I talked about. The fermion loop gave you Landau damping, omega over Q, uh, but now when you put in uh, the disorder in the fermions, uh, this Q gets cut off at basically uh, one over the mean free path of the fermions. So, so basically you get, instead of getting mod omega over Q, uh, you get uh, mod omega. And so now the boson at the critical point has a diffusive behavior. Now you take this boson propagator and you put it into this graph, this one, and you compute the self energy. Uh, and when you do that, uh, you get very excited because you get the marginal Fermi liquid behavior. Uh, and, oops, yeah, there's no reference, sorry. Uh, and this, uh, so that's what's seen in photoemission. So it seems like you're getting there. And if you compute the specific heat, uh, you find uh, T log T specific heat once you have this marginal Fermi liquid behavior. Okay, so the self-energy, instead of being omega to the two-thirds, is now marginal Fermi liquid. All right, that's exciting because that's what's seen in the experiments. The T log T is also what's seen in the experiments. So we're getting somewhere. Uh, 
It's not a non-Fermi liquid. It's a marginal Fermi liquid as far as the self-energy is concerned. But is it a strange metal as far as transport is concerned? Unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> this doesn't do it. Uh, you just go ahead and compute the conductivity. Uh, what you find now um, is that because this interaction is mostly forward scattering, um, then there's a, uh, you know, this gives you the margin for me liquid self energy, but there's a vertex correction and this cancels with this. And, and so, in fact, in the transport, you just get the Druder result. So it's just a, the transport is exactly the transport of a Fermi liquid, a disordered Fermi liquid, uh, but uh, the uh, self energy is that of a marginal. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Um, if you just take this critical boson and you put in a little bit of disorder, uh, you get a marginal Fermi liquid. But again, no strange metal resistivity. No sigma of omega going as one over omega. You just have a Druder peak, which is a Lorentzian. It falls off as one over omega squared, uh, much faster than one over omega. All right. So, so this is where we were at this sometime at the beginning of the pandemic, and I don't know, no, halfway through the pandemic. All right, we're ready to give up and move on to something else. <laughs> How are you going to solve this problem? Uh, well, but there's another new idea, which actually Avishkar Patel really came up with. Uh, and this is the, the new idea. All right, we're going to put in a different type of disorder. So if you look at actual experiments, for example, in the cuprates, and again, in many systems, uh, this is like the pairing gap that you measure in STM. You notice that the pairing gap you know, is very broad, distri distributed in energy. Its width is as large as its mean. Um, and these domain, nanometer sized domains are everywhere. Now, what can do this? Well, the idea is that this pairing gap uh, is due to the disorder in the pairing gap is due to disorder in the interaction, not the scattering potential V, but the interaction. And why should there be disorder in the interaction? There's a very simple reason. Uh, normally you think, you know, in the Anderson model for localization, uh, or, you know, you, you, take, you have some hopping matrix element, Tij, uh, this is a random number, but you have some interaction U, uh, which is supposed to be constant. But in the strongly correlated system, what you're interested in is coupling J, which is of order T squared over U. So if there's some randomness in T, there'll be randomness in J. That's what we want to put in. So what does that mean? Uh, so this J that I had here now is a, uh, has some J prime, which is a random function of position. This is constant and this is random. Uh, now you can rescale phi uh, and put it over here. And this is our final model. This is, this is the model that's going to be the solution of the, of the whole thing, at least we propose. We have a Fermi surface. Um, you have some phi squared term whose coefficient you're going to tune to make the system critical. Then there's Yukawa coupling. And the Yukawa coupling has something that's spatially uniform and then spatially random, okay? Now there's, you can add all kinds of indices like uh, someone was doing a minute ago and they can be random or non-random. That doesn't change the basic structure of the equations. What does change is whether they're random in position, okay? So this is our final model. You have randomness in, uh, in the potential and then you have randomness in the interaction. Any questions? So this is the model we're going to now study by the same methods and turn the same crank. <laughs> but in this setting, there's a, there's a coupling, the G, or the G is, or otherwise the random coupling will average to zero. So you need a, you need a parallel of the planet. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the simpler model, we just have G, this G equal to zero, but we allow for both. 
you allow for something that's random. And that's much more physical, of course. You know, there's, it's not average. It's, there is some average coupling. And then there's some fluctuation in the coupling. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Local. Yes, everything is local. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the relationship is uh, the SYK model had randomness in the interactions. Okay. This also has randomness in the interaction. That's one. And then we're going to solve it by just solving the same sort of equations. But the equations now will have extra momentum and frequency labels. That's all. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, so somebody could have solved these equations without knowing about the SYK model, but nobody did. And this is how we were led to it. We just studied the SYK model to death and we came to this. <laughs> All right, okay, so, so the way we proceed is, you know, again, take our G sigma theory and add in another term from G prime by the same rules. Look at the saddle point equations. Here they are. Uh, and now there's just two additional terms here. So what this means is that, you know, what this means. So if you have a boson and you're computing the, say, the one loop diagram for the fermion, normally you say if this was G, there is some momentum Q here, this is K, and this is K plus Q. So that we include that. But if this is G prime, then momentum is not conserved there. So this is this is Q, this is K, and this is K prime, and they're all independent. That's all. So it's a slightly different contribution. Uh, and that the fact that momentum is not conserved is related to this delta function in R space. All right, so now you just turn the crank and solve these equations. Uh, what you find is that the results for the marginal self-energy don't change. So that's a relief. Uh, it's still a marginal, marginal Fermi liquid. We wanted that. Uh, but the coefficient becomes larger. So there's two contributions to the marginal uh, Fermi liquid behavior. There's a term coming from G and the random potential that we just talked about. And the same comes from G prime. And they both give you an omega log omega, okay? And so the inelastic scattering rate is determined by both G and G prime, okay? All right, so finally, this is the test of the whole thing. Let's compute the conductivity. So now you just, it's the same graphs that were in the paper of Kim et al, that's all. It's just we're putting in some impurities and changing the momentum conservation rules a little bit. That's all. <laughs> it's exactly the same graphs that are in their paper. Uh, and you just evaluate them. Uh, and you find exactly what you wanted. <laughs> you get now that the transport scattering rate has the Druda contribution, which is V squared. So that's what would appear in a Fermi liquid. Uh, and a linear and frequency behavior. There's your linear R and temperature. This is for frequency or it'll be temperature. So there's your linear and temperature uh, resistivity. Uh, and then there's a, and this omega gives you the one over omega optical conductivity with logarithms. And uh, this is just the marginal Fermi liquid behavior where you have the Druda contribution, which is the elastic scattering rate which goes as V squared. And then you have the inelastic scattering rate, uh, which is linear in frequency or temperature. And now the key point is, the, is, that, is the comparison between this